Unplanned, the show about cities and how they work. I'm Sam, your host. Uh, Unplanned is a show that looks at all the different facets of cities. And today we've got a very important conversation with two very interesting people about Main Streets and what has happened with Main Streets in COVID, not just in the short term, which a lot of people are thinking about, but in the long term or the longer term. Uh, our guests today are Jeff Levine, who is with the faculty uh, in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT, and Emma Roberts, who is a graduate student uh, in that Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. And I want to welcome both of you to Unplanned. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, Jeff, I'm going to start with you, and we're going to talk about this study that you guys have uh, worked on, you and Emma have worked on. and. It's, it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's looking at main streets and the impact of COVID on main streets and what are some strategies going forward? Uh, I was saying uh, to Emma in an earlier conversation that, and I say this on every episode, that Unplanned really started because COVID happened and we, we, we shut down cities for a day and it was kind of the experiment you never thought you could run. You know, you actually get to see how a city works when, we, when all the systems have been shut down. You guys kind of took that issue and have run with it uh, by looking at a group of cities uh, that are fascinating all by themselves. I'm going to let you talk about the group of cities and also what this study is about. Uh, why don't you give us a little background? Sure. So, uh, so this idea um, was something that was in my head in the late spring as everybody was kind of scrambling and trying to figure out what happens in the next few weeks or few months. And I thought about the fact that there's actually a second question there, which is what happens over the next five to 10 years? Because these moments of disruption tend to have long um, impacts and we don't know 100% know what they are, but we know that we're trying all sorts of things to see if they work and some of them are not successful and some of them are way more successful than people thought. And what does that mean in the long term for, for downtowns? And uh, you know, one of the things I'm really interested in is small cities, cities of about 100,000 that are this, more or less the center of their own small micropolitan area. Um, and so decided that one of the things I'd really like to look at is how do the downtowns of those smaller cities have an opportunity and a challenge over the next five to 10 years um, after we get past this initial sort of shockwave um, and assuming that we get through it. And I think, you know, cities are very resilient. I actually think they will. Um, so what happens after that and how can you use planning tools to help maximize the success of these downtowns in the 2020s and beyond. Well, let's start, so, with, let's start yeah. with the group of, the grouping of cities, um, which is very, very interesting. And I, I think you'd use, just now used the word micropolitan, which I think is a very interesting word. Did I hear that correctly? You did, yeah. Uh, so we may, we may go back to that term because I think that's a fascinating term. I'm going to read out the list of cities that you chose to focus on. And you can tell us, and we can fold Emma into this part of the conversation as well, about um, why you chose these cities. So the list that I'm looking at right now is Flint, Michigan, Haverhill, Massachusetts, Lansing, Michigan, Nashua, New Hampshire, Portland, Maine, and Youngstown, Ohio. Why don't you give us a little bit of the background about what it was about those cities and why they seemed important to look at in a study like this? Sure, so the, um, I'll say the initial framework and then I'm gonna hand it off to Emma because she really recruited most of these communities to get involved. Um, I wanted to focus on cities that I said before were you know, relatively small, but big enough to have a, a downtown. And I wanted to try to control for some factors that might complicate data analysis. Um, so the idea was, let's find one prototype of city and really the Northeast and upper Midwest have these traditional cities with the traditional main street or streets that you know have the brick buildings that are multi-story, but generally have this traditional core. Um, and then the climate is similar in both of them. So for things like outdoor dining, we didn't want to compare a Florida with a, with a Maine. Um, and those were the initial parameters. And then after that, um, you know, Emma got involved and I, I welcome her to explain sort of how we got down with, to this list of six. Emma, what, what can you add to that? Uh, yeah, so it was, it was a kind of a fun process of elimination with setting those parameters in place and then making the list. So the first step was to just take a look at all cities in the Northeast and the upper Midwest 
that have a population between 50,000 and 150,000. And so that knocked out some states right away. Like Vermont, for example, doesn't have a single city that has more than 50,000 people. So Vermont was out. And then, you know, we did some other things like we, yeah, like Jeff mentioned, we weren't looking for any cities that are adjacent to a metropolitan, like a Cambridge or a Somerville were out. And then we also were looking for cities that didn't have a large university, for example, like an Ann Arbor or um, like a, a West Lafayette. You know, we were looking for cities that might not have a major academic institution who might already be looking into these types of questions in their, in their region. Um, and then once we got to a short list of about 14 cities um, that kind of fit all, hit, checked all the boxes we were looking for, and then um, then I came to actually doing outreach. So then I had to look up the um, local economic development uh, well, before we, let's not, we, we won't go too much into the weeds of actually finding these people and talking to them. What yeah. I am interested in, though, is what, what is it, and, and you and, and Jeff and, can speak to this, what is it about this criteria that was so important? Jeff gave a couple of factors. Another factor that really stands out to me, I think, in all of these cases, is that these are old industrial cities, by which I mean they had an industrial history, and you guys talk about that in the report, 100 years ago or 150 years ago. And in the last 60, 70 years, that has by large part disappeared as well. Was that also a factor in, in what you were looking at, what you were trying to get at with this? Indirectly it was because we wanted communities that had a walkable downtown and had um, sort of a place where you could get out of your car and actually do more than one thing. Um, so that ends up sort of by default being cities that were developed in the pre-auto era, um, which is actually a lot of the small cities in the Northeast and upper Midwest. That's interesting. Now, why don't we, let's jump into the report itself. So what were you, what were you trying to understand? Um, Jeff, why don't you start? And then Emma, why don't you follow on with some thoughts of your own? What, what, what sure. was the question you were asking? So I think the basic question was what, um, what are the challenges and opportunities that are going to face these the businesses in these downtowns in the five to 10 year time frame, And then what public actions can help maximize the benefit and the opportunity part of that and minimize the challenges. And Emma, from your perspective, what, what do you, what did you understand to be the, the questions that you were trying to get at with this, with this work? Yeah. So I think both for the, economic development professionals we interviewed, but also for the small businesses that we surveyed, really the, the bulk of the questions we were asking is, how, what does planning look like in the long term um, now that you kind of, you're experiencing this crisis and you're doing this, you know, crisis management um, right now, and you know, that's important to deal with, but even, you know, by the time we were speaking to these folks, it was about, let's see, four or five months into the pandemic. So we were trying to ask, now that you're you're in it, you kind of um, you've, you've provided some some loans, some grants. You've kind of had the opportunity to try out some new things. Now, looking forward, what kind of what does that planning look like, or what questions do you have, or what are you most concerned about? Um, thinking, you know, a, a year out or five years out, now that you've kind of experienced this unique crisis like what what are you looking to change or do differently in the future that's been informed by covid and emma why what um uh, let's talk about some of what you found in with that question what what were some of the responses i mean if it, it, it sounds like the two of you understood that all cities were scrambling uh nobody knew what covid was in a lot of ways and didn't really know how to act and react to it um, so there was a lot of sort of fire drill, everybody running to their stations and trying to figure it out. But planning is really a longer term exercise, almost by definition, that's what urban planning is. It's looking out uh, not just months, but years into the future and trying to understand what some of the forces are that are going to shape uh, both intentional and un unforeseen uh, the, the communities that we all live in. Um, what did you what did you hear? What do you think you heard from, from some of these leaders in these cities? Uh, well, I, well, I can think, start with, should I start? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, go the, ahead. the very first thing that kind of was on our minds, but also on the minds of the folks we were talking to was, 
parking, surprise, surprise. Um, you know, a lot of, that was kind of one of the first innovations that we saw. And I'd say one of the main innovations of the response to COVID was repurposing street parking for outdoor dining and other outdoor events or parking, but also underutilized spaces in general. And so there was a real mix, uh, especially from the small businesses about their perspective on the process of repurposing parking. So of course you had some who responded to the survey saying, you know, this is really frustrating for us because we're losing parking spots near the, you know, the front door of our business. And that, that makes it harder for folks to drive to us and, and come to our door. Um, and also just general frustration around street closures. Like, you know, we're, in t we're closing this entire street that hurts my business because folks can't access my door again. Um, but then you did have some, um, some positive reflection from businesses saying, you know, this was, we would, uh, you know, restaurants, for example, like we would not have survived without the city supporting us with outdoor dining. And I'd say both on the positive and negative side, also this desire to, for cities to decide, to make some longer term decisions around parking. Mm -hmm. That was par um, part of the frustration was like, well, this would, the street would be closed, but then it would just be the parking spaces and the street would be open. And mm -hmm. that were, there were a couple of comments around, we'd yeah. like for cities to decide in the long term what they want to do around this. So let's see if Jeff, you wanted to add something to that. I, I, I'm sure, I think that, you know, when I look at what people, what businesses asked about, I see three buckets of requests. One is not surprisingly money. Um, we're gonna, how do we make sure that we can re stay solvent over the long term? Um, and that goes beyond the short term pressures, but just in general, it's always a little more marginal for some of these businesses. The second um, is what Emma touched on, and that really has to do with the cities making some long term decisions about their downtowns, figuring out what areas should be given over to other uses, which areas really need short term parking. Um, is there a way to do longer term parking in a location that's a little further away um, so people can park once and walk? Um, and then finally, a lot of um, thoughts about how this brings to mind the long-term challenge a lot of these businesses have with all of the codes and regulations that are applied to them. Um, you know, a big company can handle dealing with both state and local regulations at a pretty complex level, but if you're a small mom and pop and you just want to add another bay to your store, um, you know, what can you do to make it as easy as possible and focus on regulating what really needs to be regulated, not just things that traditionally have been regulated. Well, let's, let's start with uh, your list that you've just outlined. And the first one you mentioned was money. And one of the recommendations, uh, as I recall it in your report, is that uh, money come down in the form of grants and not in the form of loans, I believe, is, is, is in there. And I, I assume that means that money just has to be available to keep businesses open. Is that accurate? And, and what would you add to that uh, comment? Is that what you found yeah. out? I mean, I think that, that definitely funding rather than technical assistance in the long term. Technical assistance was helpful initially when people really needed help. How do I build a park with? Um, but in the long run, the concern was really more for financial assistance. And the, I, Emma can jump in, but I think the concern that if you give us a loan, that's kicking the can down the road a little bit. We're always going to be two months behind if we can't get some forgiveness or some cash inflow here. Um, so it may help in the short term, but if you're talking long term, we don't want to hold that liability indefinitely. Emma, did you want to add anything on the question of money, on the discussion about money? Yeah, I would say, you know, I'm like, I'm scrolling through our little survey results, but the overwhelmingly, we asked several questions that had to do with like, you know, giving, like what would be most helpful for you in the long term and giving a bunch of options and grants was like, you know, the bar chart is way longer for that one far above loans, technical assistance, and I think we had a couple other, um, you know, options of what would be helpful in the long term, and that just far and away is what businesses said, and, and just to emphasize what Jeff had just said is we got a couple comments that said, you know, a loan isn't helpful because I don't know if I'm going to be around to pay it back. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, it's, is it even worth it for me to take out a loan if, you um, like, I don't know if I will exist to pay it back. And, you know, just that hesitancy. So um, definitely grants and also financial incentives was like top of the charts for um, a couple of questions where we asked that in different ways. 
Well, let's now let's jump to the second one on Jeff's list, uh, which is the downtowns in general. And obviously, it sounds as though parking came up as a sort of number one topic. And anybody who's ever worked in any city or urban issue knows that parking often comes up uh, both on its own and as a proxy for a whole lot of other issues. Um, what were some other things that you found in terms of the downtown? And can you tie it back to this issue of these being old industrial cities? One of the things I, found, I find so fascinating about your study is that it is looking at cities that I assume all of them have seen some hard times over the previous three, four, five, six decades when their industrial base disappeared. So they've been working hard to rebuild and reshape their downtowns. Um, COVID in some ways has presented the ultimate challenge for them, I assume, but in some ways it may also present uh, an opportunity that they couldn't foresee as well. Um, that's a big statement. Any, any thoughts on, on that? Uh, how do they wanna deal with their downtowns going forward? I don't think they spoke with, with one voice necessarily, but I think there was this feeling that they would be interested in seeing municipalities be more proactive in coming up with a long-term strategy. Um, and, you know, a lot of, to get back to your question about what, what does it mean that they have this legacy, a lot of their main streets were traditionally a main way to get through town and to somewhere else. So certainly, especially in the pre-interstate era, you would drive down the main street of a community when you were going from point A to point B. And that's part of why it thrived, is people, there was commerce happening. Um, on the flip side, as traffic increased and as cars got larger and trucks got larger, it became a detriment to actually having commerce on these streets. So trying to figure out a balance between these two things, trying to make sure that people can get access to and mobility through downtown, but also not making it so loud and noisy and messy that people don't want to be there. Um, and that's why I think where I think they were looking for some city involvement to find that balance. And Emma, another, anything on that? Yeah, another element of that conversation was around building and investing in housing in the downtown core. And so I think most, I think all six of the cities in the, in the interviews with um, economic development professionals housing came up every for all six and the theme was very much you know we're we this is something we've been working on for a decade or so you know this has been an interest of ours we are making progress on this but with the pandemic that really kind of shot up as a priority with seeing wow like now that all of our businesses are closed um, you know, or like in Lansing, for example, the state capital is closed and mm -hmm. that completely devastates the, the cafes and the restaurants who are who were able to open back up in the summer months. They don't they have no foot traffic because all of their customer base was the, um, the downtown workers. And so just that the idea of having a more permanent customer base through housing um, mm -hmm. was something that was just top of mind for I'd say all six of the cities. Mm -hmm. And let's go, let's go to the, the last of, on the list, Jeff, that you laid out, which is the regulations. Um, now regulations are fraught in a whole lot of ways and they can lead to all kinds of conversations that um, we're, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on, but, <laughs> but what are some general, some general points that, that your study uh, makes about uh, the regulatory environment in these six communities? Yeah, I mean, again, not surprisingly, the feeling that it's very hard to do anything to change to once, if I want to, if I have an innovative idea, that's great, but then I end up running into a bunch of reasons why it becomes very hard to do. And some of those reasons are understandable. It's important to have basic health code. It's good, important to think about, um, you know, aesthetics. But I think there's also this feeling that a lot of the regulations, especially in older communities, have really ossified. And there are rules and no one quite knows why they're there, but they're scared to let go of them. Um, so one of the things that's been um, one minor positive element of the disruption of the pandemic has been, let's throw out all the rules and see what happens. And then you can figure out which ones you need to bring back and which ones you say, hey, we actually never needed that rule. It's fine without that rule. Um, and this is really in three areas. Um, one would be land use regulation zoning. The second would be health code. And the third would be building code. 
um, and particularly in older downtowns, all three of them are trying to retrofit a different model onto the built environment there. And it's always challenging. Emma, your thoughts on regulations and that topic? I would say, well, and I would say even a fourth category around regulations potentially could be just when it comes to like reutilizing streets and parking. I don't know if that's, that mm -hmm. falls under land use code, but it definitely is, has a lot of rules around it. And that was something that came up with, especially when we were talking to folks who weren't at the city government. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Flint and Haverhill. Um, both the folks we interviewed there were, you know, had some, um, disagreements with you know their their organizations in the city around um, what the outdoor seating could look like and in terms specifically in terms of aesthetics um, as well mm -hmm. as street closures I know there was a quote from someone in Flint saying you know surprise surprise the vehicle city is very vehicle centric and Flint didn't end up closing any streets um, mm -hmm. for, for you know that, a lot of concerns around accessibility and parking so um, I think that was you know, the, the question again around streets and parking uh, was a challenge for some of these cities. Interesting. Um, and I, uh, to, re to first of all, this is the point of the conversation where I just want to thank you both uh, for joining us on Unplanned. Um, what, are, what are some kind of wrap up takeaways you both take, you each take from this study that you guys, uh, that you engaged in? Uh, that's one question. And the, the, the final question I'm going to ask is, where do you want this study to go? Who should see it? Who should read it? What are you hoping becomes of it? But let's start with the, the wrap ups and the, the takeaways. What, what are some of your takeaways? Emma, why don't you start? Yeah, so I'd say I think another big theme that came up with the cities was the importance of collaboration across different entities. So that was something that, you know, folks were really like surprised by if they were at the city or if they were at a, um, a bi local movement or if they were at the Chamber of Commerce, you know, that was a huge part of the initial crisis management was getting on daily calls with like 50 people across, you know, a large diversity of organizations. And I think similarly, that will need to happen for the long term planning as well, just kind of keeping that momentum going with the collaboration and the partnership with the groups who typically aren't, uh, you know, meeting at that kind of cadence. And of course that's mm -hmm. slowed now that things are a little bit more under control, but I'd say that's a theme that needs to continue um, for successful long-term planning. Um, and then in terms of who should read it, I'd say, um, you know, any, any group that's got some money in their coffers to support small businesses. Um, I think, you know, of course, small businesses continue to suffer and struggle as, you know, now we're hitting the nine month mark. Um, some of these, the same challenges are still in place. So just, um, yeah. Yeah. And Jeff, what about you? What, what are some of your takeaways from this study? Sure. So the, the report has five recommendations and I think we've hit on four of them. The only one that I would add is um, we're recommending some thought be given to the issue of commercial rents and how that's going to work in the long run. There's a structural issue where landlords will allow somebody, will, will basically have an existing tenant who's generally consistently been paying rent, they, they, they're very willing to have them not be there anymore and to try to either rent for more or at least rent for the same amount with a feeling that maybe a different tenant will be more consistent with paying the rent. And, you know, we don't, didn't have a specific solution to that, but the question that there's something going on with downtown commercial rental space and, and there's a role for municipalities to get involved. And at the one end, at the sort of most extreme regulatory end, some sort of commercial rent control, which we didn't recommend, but we said this certainly should be part of a conversation. At the other end, just playing more of a mediating role and saying, can we get landlords and tenants to try to come up with some common sort of values so that we don't end up with these vacancies that at best get filled with an ATM machine over time? Um, how do we make it so that the landlords and the businesses and the city can enter into a long-term partnership and realize the health of downtown involves everybody participating. Um, and in terms of who we, we would like to see use this study, um, you know, we were really fortunate to get funding from uh, the Urban Studies and Planning Program as part of uh, the response to COVID, um, but we didn't have an academic purpose for this. The real goal is to get it out into the communities where it can hopefully get used. So we've been showing it to various 
downtown groups. Um, and uh, the, those are the ones who I think might find it the most valuable. Well, let me, let me use that as an opportunity to, to once again say thank you to both of you. Where would people, is there an obvious place people can go to, to get this report and download it and take a look at it? Um, yes, so on the urban studies, if you go to the MIT Department of Urban Studies and Planning, which is dusp.mit.edu, um, and you search for Jeff Levine, that's my faculty page, you can download it from my faculty page. All right, well with that, uh, let me thank you both, uh, Jeff Levine and Emma Roberts uh, for sharing your important work on this very important subject. And uh, we hope to have you back on Unplanned sometime. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us.